Urban Action Showcase. Thanks for coming. Uh, this has been a, uh, a milestone for me. Uh, it's kind of um, a dream come true. Uh, two gentlemen that I've idolized uh, as a kid that gave me dreams and beliefs and something that was just out of reach that it could be achieved. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, in the ghetto, West Philadelphia, yeah. hardcore, and I always wanted to be a kung fu movie. Right. So, as a child, I had an opportunity to go and see movies from Hong Kong. However, when I finally saw films from Hong Kong that had African Americans involved, I said what I thought was impossible was possible. Um, and at that point, I began to chart a course in that direction. Uh, today we have two very, very, very special guests that have joined us. Um, and I'm honored, and I know you are honored, because you're sitting here. The first gentleman that I'm going to call up to the stage, he is a pioneer, he is the first African American ever to do films in China and Hong Kong. He is a, a legend. He is a kind human being, humanitarian, um, and he's like my godfather. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Van Cleef. to pursue a career in 
Cinema. I'm not even going to say Hong Kong. I'm just going to say saw an episode of uh, This Is Us and it features you in that. So it just goes to show you how your history has uh, preceded you. I was fortunate enough to have an agent, Betty White. She was an agent at Black Beauty Agency. And they got me a friend, which would be a friend. And so it's not. I really had no interest in it. And it was something that I wanted to, to pursue. Had the opportunity. It was not easy going to Hong Kong so, to as as an African American. They value your martial arts prowess. They did think you had an African American crew to fill the seats. It was constantly changed. You know what I said. I still got that. Yeah, the um, the Hong Kong film industry is a very rough business. Um, but um, you were a pioneer. You started it first. Carl, um, your introduction into uh, Hong Kong cinema. I will, I'll share one thing with you. I am. Um, when I was younger, I used to work in the theater, um, ordering, acquiring movies for for the theater. And uh, I was always partial to your films. So Kung Fu was popular in the 70s and 80s. So you were reflective of the, of the location in which the films were being shown. So I wanted the audience to appreciate that there was an African American 22,000 miles on the other side of the earth pursuing their dream. So can you tell us what the, the entry to your martial arts skills and what led you to Hong Kong cinema? Well, the entry to my martial arts skills started when I was very young. Um, when I was roughly around five or six years of age, um, my uncle started me off. Um, he was an excellent military and did as well. Oh, you can't hear me? Can't hear me? There you go. Because okay, this is better? Yes, sir. All right. I started. I had my introduction to martial arts when I was around five or six years of age um, from my uncle, who was a military man. And when a school opened up maybe about a half an hour from my home, the first day I was there, and I started training with BKF, Black Karate Federation, under the leadership of Steve Muhammad. That's correct. And Ron Chappelle and the great Donnie Williams. All of these brothers are people that uh, helped start me. They are heroes. They are definitely heroes, yes. And um, I continued on with um, my training from other masters, other country masters at uh, tournaments and things. They, Call me and bring me to their school again at a young age, and I would learn all types of um, systems. And um, the way I got started in the film industry is we were filming at downtown in Hollywood, and we were—I think we were working on Bruce Lee: The True Story. The man the myth. The man the myth. That's yeah. it. Yeah, the man the myth. And I was challenged as you were talking about these stuntmen. They they 
like to challenge you. And so an older gentleman decided that he wanted to challenge me and see if I really knew anything. And I didn't want to pursue it. I didn't want to get involved in it because I knew how it was with me. If you hit me in the face, we we're getting ready to rock and roll for real. It wasn't going to play it was on. And he said, oh, no, I won't hit you. I won't hit you. It's OK. Let's do it. And I says, OK, all right. Of course, I've got about, I don't know, 50 or 60 of my, my brothers from the school are, are egging me on. Go ahead, do it, do it, man. So it's your chance, do it. So I did. I went out there, and we started moving around a little bit. And the gentleman um, tried to hit me in the face. And once he did that, it just hit the switch. <laughs> and I just started, I did what I called, at that time, I did a blitz on him. So I hit him with so many moves that he had no idea what was going on. And I stopped at the end with a spinning back kick right around his eyes. Um, the, the director came out. They were filming inside of the, uh, the school. The director came out and said, who is that? Who is that? Get him! <laughs> and Alice Hoss, uh, was the owner of Eternal Films Colonel. Right, that's correct. Right. And she came over to me. And she said, I need your name. I need your name and your number. I said, what? She says, please, I need your name and number. And I gave it to her. A week later, she called my home and had me and my mom come out to Hollywood. And we sat at a hotel and they made a four, a four uh, movie deal with me. I had no idea. I had never done anything but just fight. That's all I love to do is fight. Wow. Yes. So that was my beginning, and here I am today. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Seeing these individuals in the audience and the love and celebration of your career and your life, how does that make you feel? It's quite humbling. I do what I do because that's the only thing I know. I feel that uh, I can do it with my best potential. Uh, just, I just need martial arts. I'm going to start studying uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when I'm 16 years old. That's kind of all the stuff I came up in the school that I was in, and they also crazy from the source, right? I've been like 20 years ago. It's been a kind of busy music career for like now, six months. Three times every day. That's a big one. That's a big one. It's so strong. It's so talented. Oh, it's so good. The is so good. It's so talented. I just want to get better. I, I love Jiu Jitsu as I do Chinese Go Jiu. As I do it, it's all one. When I started studying Jiu Jitsu in Paris, when I thought, what is crazy? I can never see it more. I was 51 years old. I remember yeah. the birthday was the wife, and he was 26. Five minutes, we had to play each other. I said, I don't know the time that I would want to learn something that would improve my ground game. Because he raises the oldest of the race of brothers. Yes. And he's an asset. He truly is. He truly is. Um, and you are a living testament, I mean, to be doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Jiu -Jitsu at this age. Wow, amazing. Two years as a white belt, five years as a blue belt. Absolutely. And now, 10 pieces of purple belt. Incredible, incredible. Great job. Seven more years on your back? That's right. That's right. Many more years to come. Because I'm not going to quit. I know. That's five years. Now, I start to just be an old man sitting watching TV with my 12 year old son. It's all good. It's skills. Great answer, sir. Last night you received an award for your lifetime achievement award for all of your accomplishments in motion picture. 
I asked you in Friday yesterday, and I'll, I'll ask it in public. Did you ever think that your films would have this much effect so many years later? Uh, absolutely not. I had no idea. I was totally humbled last night. Um, the outpouring of love that was shown to me by all the wonderful people that were there, um, it was tremendous. I'm still feeling it right now. And I'm still feeling it. You have no idea. Um, for many years, I stayed out of the public life. I didn't put myself out there. I got a lot of offers from people that wanted me to come out and do um, workshops at their place, uh, or films, movies they wanted me to do. And I just stepped back and reevaluated myself, my whole self, with my family and my children. That was the most important thing to me at that time. Um, I love my wife who's sitting over there, humble as she always is, and my beautiful daughters and son. And that was my, my thing. That was my all in all right there. Um, I had a chance to, to train them at a young age, and now I'm in the middle of training my son to take over my legacy. Which I know is, uh, I met the young man yesterday. I mean, he's a fine young man. He is humble, gracious, and kind. All the qualities that you actually said. Job well done. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We have a lot more to, to give and a lot more to do. And I believe that with the help of the Grand Master right here and all the others, and yourself as well, and um, I think we can move forward. And, and I think the people will get a lot more from uh, Carl Scott than they've seen, ever seen before. So, yes. that Robert and I are going to work together and get a project started. We're going to do something very special. I think you guys will absolutely love it. Yeah. 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 Mr. Van Cleef, you've been supporting the Urban Action Showcase for the past six years. Tell me how this event helps young and upcoming filmmakers and people that want to do what you did become what you became. I find this event to be an awesome event because it has so much amazing talent, actors, stunt people, um, writers, directors, cameramen. It's such a vast pool of amazing talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I look at some of the stuff that you do, it's the last new generation of us. It's amazing. It's very bright. Thank you. I appreciate what you are doing here. You're better than we were. <laughs> so, as with anything, you know, I want, to, I want the audience, I don't want to just keep feeding questions. I want to give you an opportunity to uh, ask them, because I, you obviously gave because you appreciate your films. This way, you'll have an intimate way of getting answers directly to you from these outstanding grandmasters. Sir? Hi, um, my name is Joe Rebello. Kyle Scott, I gotta tell you, you're the reason I'm here. Okay, and when I heard you were going to hear, you make, it's so rare to have you here, it's so rare for you to make a public appearance. The moment I heard, I knew I had to be here. Um, I, you talk about Bruce Lee, the man in the myth, but there's, there's a little note that a lot of people aren't aware of, and I want you to confirm this for me. Many people aren't aware of, they're doing the 45th anniversary of Resident Dragon. There's a scene at Stevens, then Sanders School for BKF, and in those lines of students, do I see a young Carl Scott throwing punches? Uh, yes, you do, sir. You're absolutely right oh, about that. Yeah. I, I have to point that out because I recognize you immediately. Then I'm going, what's Carl Scott? <laughs> Which means I don't have a life. But I mean, I just, you know, um, talk to me about that. How did all that, that scene all come about back then? Well, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate you very, very much. Thank you for the kind words that you gave to me about me. 
Um, back in the day, it was the word was that uh, Mr. Lee wanted Steve Muhammad, Steve Sanders at that time to play the role that Jim Kelly was playing. But unfortunately, he didn't have any acting skills or anything like that. And Mr. Kelly had previously did a couple of movies and he was um, in the uh, Actors Guild and what have you. So that put him ahead of Mr. Muhammad. Um, now it's Mr. Muhammad for that particular role. But um, Mr. Lee wanted Mr. Muhammad to be in that film. So what they came up with is having Kelly come to our school, which was on 103rd and Western, and and film that that part of the um, the the, uh, the movie with uh, Jim Kelly coming over and and what have you. The other thing was um, one one good point to bring up about that particular movie was um, our one of the scenes that Kelly had with uh, he was fighting in the alley which was like right around the corner from our school and kelly was doing some really whack stuff i'm sorry to say it was just whack <laughs> no no what the hell are you doing jim you know it looked like he was uh, doing a meal kick or something and everybody was laughing and it was so funny and um steve went over to him and said Wait a minute, brother, wait a minute, let me show you something. Why don't you do this? And he showed him one quick little technique and he showed him the hammer fist to the groin and then he showed, now you can do your, your heel thrust kick, okay? And he did that and it turned out to be uh, something that was put in the movie. So that's interesting to know. <laughs> all right, first of all, I, I just want to salute both of you gentlemen. It is awesome to see you uh, here still striving and being a part of such a, uh, this is so iconic and epic for uh, uh, my friend and I. Uh, my question for you too is this, during your career at, at the height of your fame, did you experience any form of racism feel, uh, uh, you know, during the filming or uh, anyone challenging you? and making you feel as outsiders. We heard the N-bomb being dropped a couple of times in uh, Sun Dragon. You know, I want to know if that translated in real life uh, for you. That is my question for you, gentlemen. And I salute you once again. Yes, there is racism, but it's, it's not the same thing as what we uh, experience <coughs> In Hong Kong, if you're not Chinese, you're already dead. You know, the, the spirit is already dead, you're already dead. It's not like if you're a ghost, you know, we will hop off black ghost, white ghost, white ghost. You are already dead anyway, so whatever you did. The wonderful thing about Hong Kong is if you prove yourself to be of use and you have abilities, whether it be martial arts or acting or singing or dancing or Anything. If you're skilled, they appreciate your skill. That's what I loved about living in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Living in Hong Kong 10 years. It was, a, it was a great experience. I mean, I was challenged several times by stunt guys. You know, you take them on the, uh, like I said, you beat them up. You can. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Years ago, I was working on a film with Richie Fonnier. Rashan Khan, I don't know if he's still here. He was uh, Richard's bodyguard. He's the person that introduced me to celebrity bodyguard. Who him? I got Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson, a whole bunch of guys introduced Rashan. Rashan took me back behind the trail. He hit my butt. He swept me so far off the arm and leg. My head hit the cement. I was almost like Richie Price, you look jazzed. <laughs> <laughs> it was the laugh of the day. <laughs> I couldn't walk, I lived for like a week. Because the iron room was weak on cement. You know, we had not so much of that. I had to go back and shoot it. Wow. What do you see? 
Well, for me, I um, it was um, the experience that I had in terms of racism wasn't as bad as you may think at that particular time. Um, I remember filming in Taiwan, and I was in a little village. And in that particular village, they had never seen a black man ever before. I mean, they seen, uh, in Taiwan, they had the soap. The soap was blackface. So the, your, it's a, it's a soap, uh, toothpaste, I'm sorry, toothpaste, garlic toothpaste, that's it. It's a blackface, that's what it is. And so that's the only thing that they can recognize as a black man. And me being as young as I was at that time, and a young African American, they wanted to see and feel and touch and look at me, and they didn't, I mean, I, I, we're filming, and the next thing you know, we have about, oh, I don't know, three or 400 people coming down behind the street. What the heck was going on? And then another 300 behind them, they all want to see me. And then, and, and I wasn't scared or anything like that. I, I was respectful to the fact that they wanted to touch me. They wanted to touch my hair. You know, you got that as well. Yeah, and, and that was something that they said, oh no, don't worry, they're not gonna hurt you. They're not trying to hurt you. They're just curious. They had never seen a black person before. Um, now, I could have taken that as a racist thing, you know, where, ah, oh, man, these people coming out here playing, grabbing on my hair, touching on me and stuff like I'm some kind of animal or something. But I understood what it was. It was, it was the culture shock. It was the fact that they had never seen a black man before. Um, but I represented us very well. And uh, it was a good experience eventually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll get to you in one second real quick. Uh, for me, I did experience racism to a degree. I did a film called uh, um, Moby Bay, which is Don't Give a Damn. And in the film, uh, they shot the scene when I wasn't around. And basically, uh, uh, Takeshi Kenshiro uh, is dressed up in blackface. And he's got a nappy wig on his head. And Yun Biao asked him a series of questions. Um, and it was, the questions were, how do you, how am I better a black person than a natural black person? I can tell you I, I'm better because a black, they answered questions and the questions they answered was, oh, blacks rape and rob every 10 seconds in New York City, things of that nature. So I didn't actually see that scene until I went to the actual premiere of the, of the of the movie in Hong Kong. I was I was a bit incensed, um, but I, I kind of knew where it came from. I knew that the writer of the film uh, did not get along with Sam, and he didn't like black people. Um, and he let that be known in his writings. Um, so I did experience it. There was a couple times when I would ride the train and they would all stare at me. So I, I, one day I went home and asked Sam, I said, they keep staring at, me, staring at me. And he said, well, I'm gonna teach you what to say. And you just say it when they stare at you. So I get on the train the next day, and uh, they're all staring again. And I just say, name on my line yet. Well, everybody jumped up and moved to the other end of the car. <laughs> so, you know, I asked Sam, what did you tell me to say? I said, in Chinese, it was like, what the fuck are you looking at? So, and I'm telling you, trust me, uh, there's a gentleman here who knows how Sam is. Roberto Lopez, right there. You worked with Samuel before. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. I'll get to you in one second. Thank you. Yes. It's definitely an honor to be in the presence of uh, these amazing uh, martial artists. You know, we're just as well. Uh, thank you for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 I have a big movie coming out called Creed 2, where I have a, I play the role of Versace Polo. All right. So you guys, I'm sure, will be able to see that as well. Sir, thank you. Well, how was uh, this question to, uh, to Grandmaster? <clears throat> how was the experience of working with Bruce Lee himself on set? Well, actually, I didn't get a chance to work with the actual Bruce Lee. I was able to work with Bruce Lai. 
Yes. However, I did get a chance to train with the real Bruce Lee many, many years ago. Um, you have to realize I started martial arts in 1968. And at that time, we were in, doing Kenpo Karate. And you didn't have shoes, karate shoes. You didn't have gear, hand gear. It was uh, mostly all white uniforms, no black uniforms. So everything that we did at that time was, I guess you could say it was blacks against whites. Everyone was always uh, so negative about um, black men. You know, you couldn't do what we do and that type of thing. And that's one of the reasons why the um, BKF was, was formed, Black Karate Federation. But we didn't treat it like that because we had Caucasians, we had um, Mexicans, we had uh, or Spanish people, we had all different races in our organization. I hope I didn't get off track on your question, but I just said what I felt. There you go. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> bro. Uh, first of all, I want to salute you guys, man. You guys have been great. Calling this is directly for you. Um, you got a chance to work with one of my favorite Kung Fu movie stars, Billy Chong, and he says a lot of good things about you. Matter of fact, you guys were the first rush out before Jackie Chan, right? <laughs> wasn't it? So, so right. you guys, what was it like to work with him? Because he said a lot of good things about you. Well, I'm not going to say anything bad about Billy because he's okay with me. He's a cool guy. Um, you know, I learned a lot from Billy when we were filming. I learned a lot from him. Some of the things that I learned from him were, I'll give you an example, if you looked at uh, the Sun Dragons, you noticed that he did a technique and he went, swing, swing. And he stopped. I mean, and I thought, oh, that's cool, man. That's really cool, you know. So, and then he got another set, uh, another movie, uh, not another movie, another um, technique that he performed. Thank you. Uh, was with the weapons, and he was doing like this, and the, the cameraman had it going like the Bruce Lee thing, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. I said, oh, that is so cool. I wanted to do that, right? And I got a couple of um, chances to do it, but it was because of Billy. You know, he would always tell me, uh, do this, do that, you know. This looks better, that looks better, you know. Can you do this and show me a kick or something? I said, I can do that, man. Okay, do it. Uh, so he was a good guy. I really, really like him and Lo Ming as well.